Life Insurance Company proudly presents Indiana Celebration, the 43rd NCAA Basketball Championship. Hello, everyone. I'm Dick Hanberg, and I'll be your host as we relive the 1981 NCAA Basketball Championship. And I think you'll agree that 1981 etched its own special place into the history of this prestigious event. Yes, like those years previous, it was a different drama distinguishing itself from the other colorful tournaments played every year since 1939. On March 12th, that large field was reduced to 48 select teams, which began play in this year's championship. Upset became the early theme in 1981, surprising teams like Wichita State, St. Joe's, James Madison, Alabama, Birmingham, and others edged their way toward Philadelphia, the site for the 1981 finals. Four strong survivors emerged, Virginia and North Carolina, Louisiana State, and Indiana. Some said that this was the strongest Final Four in the history of this grand championship. Louisiana State, the Tigers received an at-large berth in the Midwest Regional because of its outstanding 28-3 record. In the Midwest, the Tigers tacked on three NCAA victories, a 100-78 win against Lamar. Then they fought off pesky Arkansas, 72-56 in the regional semifinals. LSU then outmuscled Wichita State, 96-85 in the regional finals behind Rudy Macklin's 21 points. And so it was in the Midwest. To the Mideast, the Indiana University Hoosiers, who ironically defeated LSU in the Tigers' last semifinal appearance back in 1953. The Hoosiers, a 21-9 record behind them, buried Maryland 99-64 in the second round, had their hands full against Alabama-Birmingham 87-72 in the regional semifinals, and ended St. Joe's Cinderella story 78-46. The Hoosiers had earned their fifth trip to the Final Four. Now to the West and North Carolina. Carolina's 28-7 record included winning the Atlantic Coast Conference postseason tournament and advancing with an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament, its seventh consecutive trip. The Tar Heels eliminated Pittsburgh 74-57 in the second round before taking a 61-56 victory against Utah on its home court in Salt Lake City in the regional semifinals. All-America Al Wood scored 21 points and leading the Tar Heels to a comfortable 82-68 win over Kansas State in the West Finals and their trip to Philadelphia. In the East, Virginia. The Cavaliers won their first 23 games before losing to Notre Dame late in 1981. After losing in the conference postseason tournament to Maryland, the Cavaliers received an at-large bid to the East Regional. Villanova provided Virginia a 54-50 scare, followed by a come-from-behind 62-48 win against Tennessee in the regional semifinals. Sampson rallied Virginia past Brigham Young 74-60 in the East Finals to earn the Cavaliers their first trip ever to the Final Four. And there you have it, four roadmaps that led to a head-on collision in Philadelphia to where this prize was awaiting the survivor in the 1981 NCAA Basketball Championship, regarded by many as the most treacherous in history. The spectrum was pumped to the rafters with excitement, awaiting the celebration to begin. Indeed, it's one of the sports classics of any year, the National Collegiate Basketball Championship. Let the celebration begin. Apparently not intimidated by the packed house of over 18,000 frenzied college basketball fans, plus millions more watching on national television, LSU controlled the tip, and Ethan Martin found freshman sensation Leonard Mitchell, who left Indiana center Ray Tolbert flat-footed. Isaiah Thomas, the first sophomore consensus All-America in Indiana history, to Landon Turner, who evened the score at two apiece. LSU took a brief three-point lead at 5-2, but neither team could pull away. The point guard for each team, Indiana's Thomas and LSU's Martin, proved their worth in the early going. Thomas's drive with just over three minutes gone gave the Hoosiers an 8-7 lead, but proved costly when he was assessed his second personal foul on a charging call. Martin provided the Tigers a 9-8 advantage. Thomas hurried up court, hit Randy Whitman. Indiana 13, LSU 11. Moments later, Martin found senior All-America Rudy Macklin. LSU 16, Indiana 14. 
Bobby Knight was not pleased with the way things were going. Now move through the offense, and then after we made four or five passes, if you have your shot, go up and stick it in the hole, but don't take the shot on that basis now. Come on. LSU moved with its own purpose by gaining a four-point lead. First it was Mitchell off Martin's feed. Indiana still seemed confused when Martin picked his way through traffic, spotted senior Willie Sims for a 20-16 LSU lead. Thomas hit back-to-back -back buckets, including this nifty 10-footer. LSU center Greg Cook sandwiched a basket in between, and the Tigers still held a 22-20 advantage. With four and a half minutes left in the half, Indiana regained the lead 27-26 when Tolbert snatched Martin's missed shot and fired a bomb to Thomas. LSU went back in front 28-27 on Howard Carter's 11-footer. Martin completed the first half scoring with a pair of free throws on Thomas's third personal with just over three minutes remaining. Neither team shot well in the first half. Indiana just over 36%, LSU 40. The Hoosiers were out-rebounded 24-18. Things weren't going right for the cream and crimson. Let's just do one thing this half. Let's play 20 minutes of basketball our way. Let's go, fellas. That's just what the Hoosiers did. It was one of the most classically executed halves in NCAA history. Other than Thomas's 12 points in the first half, Indiana had nothing to brag about. Tolbert was held to three points and only one rebound. Apparently, Knight's halftime oratory provided inspiration as Tolbert introduced LSU to a mere sampling of what the Hoosiers had in mind for the second half. Indiana would score the first 11 points, nine by Turner. Including the last three minutes, 14 seconds of the first half, the Tigers would go over eight minutes without a point, and Coach Dale Brown was understandably concerned. You gotta just keep on pressure on them all the time. We're gonna be all right, but don't lose your tenses. Come on, fellas! But Turner was devastating in those opening minutes. With 16 and a half minutes left, Thomas drew his fourth personal, and LSU acquired another opportunity to get its act together. The score, 36-30 Indiana. But the Tigers didn't anticipate that trading first names, Isaiah for Jim, would make the Hoosiers even tougher. Jim Thomas, number 20, no relation to Isaiah, would finish with only two points, but it was his nine rebounds, two assists, two block shots, and a steal that allowed his teammates the scoring glory. And Turner was one of the beneficiaries as he was simply marvelous in those first moments of the half. Indiana pulled ahead 38-30. Carter finally, yes, finally broke LSU's long drought when he hit from the baseline with just under 15 minutes left. And the game wasn't out of reach at 38-32. But with Jim Thomas performing like an acrobat, Indiana was able to play the disciplined style preached by Knight. LSU was frantic as Indiana outscored the Tigers 10-2 after Carter's shot had ended that first dry spell. Whitman's shot put the Hoosiers on top, 44-34, with just under 13 minutes remaining. LSU hit only four of 17 shots. Indiana wasn't necessarily blistering the net themselves, 9 for 25, but the Hoosiers had more opportunities because of a 20-9 rebound edge. With six minutes left, Indiana had built a 54-39 lead. We're really going to see what we're made out of. Because our hearts are hurting right now, we'll see what the hell we're made out of the last six minutes. But everything was hurting for LSU. It's defense. Tolbert put Indiana up 60 to 39, and the turnovers. The Tigers would finish with 19 for the game. Talk about pain. Perhaps this series of shots late in the game told the frustrating story of the Tigers' disappointing second half. Count them. Finally, Macklin desperately tries number five. It just wasn't LSU's day. It was a frustrating feeling as LSU suffered its worst loss of the season. Indiana had outscored the Tigers 40 to 19 in the second half. Turner led all scorers with 20. Isaiah Thomas chipped in with 14. But it was Jim Thomas's outstanding hustle which may have been the key to Indiana's 67-49 victory. 
their fifth trip to the finals provided hopes of achieving a fourth national title. It was deja vu for Bobby Knight, the only individual ever to win the NCAA title as a player at Ohio State in 1960 and as a coach at Indiana in 1976. So the first feature of the 1981 celebration was history as North Carolina and Virginia restlessly awaited their third confrontation of the season. Virginia had won both regular season encounters after North Carolina blew big second half leads. The Cavaliers were led by Associated Press Player of the Year, Ralph Sampson. A 7'4 sophomore, some experts said, was as dominant a player as Lou Alcindor or Bill Walton had been at UCLA. North Carolina was hoping for revenge in this third encounter of 1981. The Tar Heels were ready with an awesome front line, headed by All-America and 1980 U.S. Olympic standout, Al Wood. In the first ever All-Atlantic Coast Conference NCAA semifinal, Jeff Jones fed Jeff Lamp, Virginia's other All-America, for his second consecutive baseline shot, putting the Cavaliers on top, 4-2. to two. Samson received a sampling of what he could expect for the day when Jimmy Black stole the ball. Black hit freshman center Sam Perkins for the equalizer. Freshman guard Othell Wilson hit his third consecutive shot with under 12 minutes until intermission, putting the Cavaliers on top, 10-6. Wood retaliated over Virginia's own. Virginia had a 12-8 lead when James Worthy tried to stuff and drew Sampson's first personal, much to his dislike. Wood brought Carolina within two at 15-13 on a 17-footer with about nine minutes left in the half. Sampson was squeezed by a tough 1-3-1 Carolina zone designed to pressure him inside. Stick still managed to find the basket on this maneuver, putting the Cavs on top 17-14. Worthy closed the gap to one. And then followed with a turnaround off Black's assist. Cavalier reserve Lewis Lattimore had a tip in between Worthy shots, and it still was a one-point lead for Virginia, 19-18. Lamp and Lee Raker to Sampson. Another score inside. Raker's layup off Jones' pass put the Cavaliers up 23-21 with less than two minutes remaining in the half. Wood tied the game at 23, and free throws by both teams netted the score at 25 with under a minute. Carolina decided to go for the last shot, went to its bread and butter man, Wood, who put the Tar Heels ahead 27-25 with seven seconds on the clock. Raker quickly put the ball in play to Jones. Jones hustled up court, fired a bullseye as the buzzer sounded. Dean Smith knew his team had let up as the teams headed for the locker room. Wood led all scores with 14 points, but more importantly, Carolina had limited Sampson to four shots, five points, and just three rebounds. Action in the second half resembled that of the first as neither team could find a break and a decisive lead. Black drove the lane. Sampson was called for goaltending. Virginia 30, North Carolina 29. Black hit a key basket, followed by another by Perkins. Black went for it again with 15 minutes to go in the game when Sampson was called for another goaltending violation. North Carolina suddenly found itself with a 36-30 lead. Sampson was continually frustrated by Perkins and his defensive accomplice Worthy. Wilson also had his problems. Meanwhile, the Tar Heels certainly had to remember blowing leads in their two earlier games against Virginia. A field goal by Raker and two free throws by Sampson made up the deficit. Raker tallied an easy layup off an assist by Lamp and connected for a three-point play on Worthy's foul that tied the game at 37. Black put Carolina ahead 39-37. With 12 and a half minutes remaining in the game, Virginia would never catch up. With the preliminary entertainment concluded, 
the Al Wood Show became the main attraction. The 6'6 senior sharpshooter from Gray, Georgia, needed only three minutes to hit Carolina's next 13 points. It was an incredible one-man performance. This three-point play put the Tar Heels up 44-37. Virginia had switched to a box-and-one defense and finally to man-to-man. -man. Jones and then Wilson tried their best. No good. Sampson was still having his problems. Perkins wasn't intimidated and even seemed to enjoy his assignment on the big man. Guess who? Would you believe Carolina did? And Virginia certainly had to start confirming any doubts. Tar Heels 48, Cavaliers 37. Woods nine points plus two by Black had outscored Virginia 11 to nothing. Jones hit two shots, including a three-point baseline drive, and was fouled by Wood. North Carolina, 48, Virginia, 42. The Cavaliers tried to pressure Carolina into believing number three was not the charm, and another second-half nightmare was in the works. Someone forgot to tell Wood. Jones narrowed the score to six at 52-46. Just over eight minutes remain. Perkins missed on an out-of-bounds play, but alertly put it back up. Sampson was called for his third goaltending violation of the half and reflected his total frustration. Carolina, 54, Virginia, 46. Worthy blocked Jones' shot, and Wood was off to the races. Perkins was at the finish and put the heels on top by 10 with six and a half minutes remaining. Wilson wasn't about to give up when he narrowed the score to 60-52. Wood continued his destruction, and Lamp was detected for knocking on Wood, who tallied his 35th point on the foul shot, breaking his career high of 34. With two minutes to go, Carolina had built a 72-56 lead when Wood hit again. Wood scored once more for his 39th point, breaking Jerry West's national semifinal record of 38 for West Virginia back in 1959. He had 25 points in the second half, all with just over 13 minutes left in the game. The offensive performance he displayed against the University of Virginia is one of the finest overall games I've ever seen a college player enjoy. North Carolina 78, Virginia 65. Aside from Wood's great performance, Sampson was held to just 11 points on outstanding defense by Perkins and help from Worthy. The third time proved to be the charm for the Tar Heels. They were headed to their fifth finals appearance. The celebration was peaking as the final four had been whittled down to the surviving two. Indiana and North Carolina, two of the top masterminds in the coaching profession, Bobby Knight and Dean Smith. This was a college basketball fanatic's dream. Two great universities, superb athletes, and outstanding coaches. In the preliminary third place game, Jeff Lamp of Virginia scored 25 points and Lee Raker added 21 in leading the Cavaliers to a 78-74 victory over LSU. March 30th, 1981. It will go down as a tragic day in the history of the United States and the NCAA basketball championship. The celebration was marred with the news of the attempted assassination and wounding of President Ronald Reagan and three others. The NCAA decided to proceed with the finals once it was learned President Reagan's prognosis was excellent. It was a humbling day for everyone who was celebrating college basketball's biggest day. Bobby Knight had been here before. In 1976, here in the Spectrum, he won his first NCAA title. He compared his 76 squad with the 1981 team at a press conference the day before. The final result in 1976 was a very satisfying thing for all of us involved. It was sort of a culmination of a lot of work and a lot of effort on the parts of a lot of people. The satisfaction with this team uh, has come through watching it grow and develop. Many people were labeling this a Knight versus Smith confrontation, but Smith had his own observations. I don't believe it's ever one coach versus another coach. It's certainly a program versus another program, but more importantly, a student athlete of that particular school playing against the student athletes of the other school. Obviously, the players listen to the coach and 
coaching does have something to do with any game. Two class teams led by classy All-Americas were ready to go. North Carolina's Al Wood and Indiana's Isaiah Thomas, teammates on the 1980 U.S. Olympic team, shared a lighter moment seconds before tip-off. North Carolina attacked Indiana's man-to-man -man defense and capitalized on its first trip down floor when James Worthy latched onto Jimmy Black's pass. Indiana had difficulty getting on track. Landon Turner hit two free throws, but it was over five minutes before the Hoosiers hit their first field goal on Steve Risley's tip-in off a missed drive by Thomas. Meanwhile, North Carolina had jumped to an 8-4 lead. Thomas calmly hit a picture jumper from the top of the key, and Indiana appeared to be getting things together. Indiana center Ray Tolbert tied the game at 8 with 13 minutes remaining in the half. North Carolina outscored Indiana in a little over three minutes, eight to nothing. Wood ignited the surge on this picture feed from Black and Perkins. The Hoosiers continued to have all sorts of problems. Black Steel set up an uncontested goal. And the Tar Heels were now up 12 to eight. Perkins made the score 14 eight. And Wood showed early signs of duplicating his semifinal performance by putting Carolina ahead 16-8. Smith was cautious, but obviously enjoying his team's sudden strike. Following a timeout, Indiana regrouped. Turner hit two in a row, including a baseline jumper off Thomas's pass. North Carolina 16, Indiana 12. Jim Thomas came in when the Hoosiers were down 16 to 8. Combining with his namesake Isaiah, the two found Turner moments later, and that narrowed the score to 20 to 18, North Carolina. With just over five minutes to go in the half, Jim Thomas collected the rebound. Randy Whitman hesitated, but found the range to tie the score at 20. Worthy and Whitman each hit field goals to negate an advantage for either team. And then Wood spotted Worthy inside. It was a two-point Tar Heel advantage with a little more than four minutes left before halftime. A series of fouls in Carolina's control game spanned the next four minutes. North Carolina held a 26-25 lead when the Hoosiers took advantage of Whitman's hot hand. He dropped a bomb as the buzzer sounded. Indiana, 27. North Carolina, 26. The Hoosiers' first lead of the game. Whitman scored six points out of Indiana's last nine. It was a key to a more comfortable halftime for the Hoosiers after their shaky start. Just as they had done in the semifinals against LSU, the Hoosiers stung quickly in the second half. Carolina controlled the tip, but Isaiah Thomas turned things around with his aggressive defensive play. And Indiana led 29-26. But the poised Tar Heels refused to be rattled. Worthy lofted a perfect feed to Perkins, narrowing the margin to one. Smith provided the sideline support. After a Turner layup, Isaiah Thomas continued his All-America play, turned his second steal into another futile foot race. Indiana led 33-28 with just 90 seconds gone in the second half. Whitman put the Hoosiers up by seven at the 17-minute mark. Despite Indiana's aggressive intimidation, Wood dished off to Black in the corner to reduce the lead to five. Indiana led 39-30 on Thomas's second straight basket. It was his eighth point of the Hoosiers' 12 in the second half. The Chicago natives seemed to be everywhere. North Carolina needed to cool off Indiana. The Hoosiers were six of seven from the floor in this half. Indiana maintained a deliberate, disciplined game. Jim Thomas spotted an opening for Turner. The Hoosiers were playing impeccably. Indiana, 41. North Carolina, 32. Black narrowed the margin to seven. Indiana was patiently putting on a clinic called Team Control, and Isaiah's mid-air antics, oh my! Carolina fans were frustrated, 
but had too much experience themselves with this style of play in Tar Heel country to berate the Hoosiers. With eight minutes remaining, North Carolina was having problems with Indiana's aggressive defensive play. Perkins went up for a two-pointer, missed, but Wood followed for only his second goal of this half. Indiana 45, North Carolina 38, the closest the Tar Heels would come for the remainder of the game. Things just weren't going right for Carolina Blue. Indiana was in control, and it became increasingly evident as the clock wound down. And Indiana was in no hurry to score. But when your team is playing textbook basketball, you can't pass up an opportunity. Right, Isaiah? Knight could sense his second national title. Make sure we've got an open shot going to the bucket. And then work my Cal defense, okay? Hey, come on! Let the whole year go out there. With three and a half minutes to play, Isaiah Thomas was simply outstanding. He put the Hoosiers up by 12, 51-39. Indiana shot a brilliant 63% in the second half. Indiana had kept its Philadelphia magic alive with a 63-50 victory. The celebration was left for only one team. Bobby Knight had turned an early 7-5 club into one that peaked when it all counted. Indiana's 26-9 record became the most losses ever for an NCAA basketball championship team. But the record was academic. Isaiah Thomas led all scores with 23 points and was named the tournament's most outstanding player. He was joined on the all-tournament team by Hoosier teammates Landon Turner and Jim Thomas, who despite scoring only four points in two games, collected 13 rebounds and 10 assists, eight against North Carolina. The three Hoosiers were joined by Carolina's Al Wood and Virginia's Jeff Lamb. Yes, it was a celebration. Hoosier hysteria style. Combined with Michigan State's 1979 crown, it was the third title for a Big Ten team in six years since Indiana's last Philadelphia visit. It all started with 259 teams last November, and only one survived, the Hoosiers of Indiana, the 1981 National Collegiate Basketball Champion. Indeed, it was an Indiana celebration.